Well, hello everyone. My name is Lucy. I am the Director of Youth Education here at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Even though actually my background is the best example because Andrew, you have the actual museum in your background. Are you recording live really from there good, tonight? Yeah. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're so excited to have you tonight join us virtually. Um, and I'm going to let Andrew introduce himself, but I'm so lucky to be joined. Hey, Andrew. My name's Andrew, and I'm the, <laughs> I'm the historian and curator uh, here at the International Spy Museum. But as you will quickly detect, I am not originally from DC. Uh, it's actually a Maryland accent you detect. Um, nice one. <laughs> you make a horrible yeah. spy. <laughs> yeah. um, but we're so excited to have you guys tonight. I and I, I use the word excited in a general sense, it's always great to connect with teachers and hear where you all are from. Um, but it's also a topic that I think we all struggle with. Um, you are, We all lived it, um, even though I feel like every year I run into teachers who are like, yeah, I, I was a baby. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, but if you don't know why you're here tonight, we are talking about September 11th, and we're looking at it from the intelligence angle for teachers uh, as we approach the 20th anniversary, which I was talking to Andrew earlier today, and it blows my mind that we are approaching 20 years. Um, we wanted to do something to help teachers teach about this. And we here at the Spy Museum think that intelligence is a fantastic way to teach about 9-11. Um, and so we're gonna try and go through that today, sort of in a timeline, um, but also throughout providing resources and activities, as well as just content. Because I think what if you feel empowered and you feel like you know the content and are confident, then it makes you a better teacher. Um, as Andrew knows, I always come in like, am I right? Did I say that right? And I always want to confirm before I ever teach something. Uh, a couple of quick logistical things before we get started. I have two screens here tonight. I have you guys on the screen, and then I have another screen over here that has the chat that has the PowerPoint. So if I look over here for a second, please don't assume that I'm looking at something else. Um, I'm just making sure that I'm following everything. And we also have uh, my fellow colleague, Liz, who is on the back end answering those questions that you guys have. So feel free to type in chat if you guys have a question. I always say spelling doesn't count. Um, and either Andrew, Liz, or myself will answer those questions. Um, and we also, before we get started, we know right now is an interesting time in the world um, with everything going on in Afghanistan. Andrew and I have been spending the past couple of weeks just figuring out how do we talk about Afghanistan because we are not experts. It is still unfolding every day. And so at the end, if we have time, we're happy to answer any questions that we feel comfortable answering that we know about. And I know Andrew has done some um, media interviews about it. Um, but we didn't feel like tonight was night to really delve into that topic. Um, but what I will say is there are some parallels that we're going to talk about tonight as well and some articles that we share that I think your students can also make parallels to. Um, so Andrew, should we jump right in? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> um, so the first thing you are looking at here is a picture from our Faithful Failures exhibit at the International Spy Museum. Um, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But before we go into the Fateful Failures exhibit, I need to thank our or our supporter for tonight, who without their support, we would not be able to offer these programs free of charge for thousands of teachers around the country and the world. Um, so with the generous support of the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, we are able to offer these programs. So I cannot thank them enough, as well as, um, and I also put this in this thank you email that I'll send out later, they have been so generous and are supporting free workshops and free museum admission for Title I schools. So if you are a Title I school, we are now able to offer free workshops, yay, virtual and on-site and in-person in -person museum admission uh, thanks to their support. So we cannot thank them enough. And I just realized I'm not sharing my screen. So, you know, in the world of spying, Thank you to my fabulous colleague on the back end. Andrew, thanks for not telling me. I, I thought you were that, doing something fancy. I you know, know. I, I try sometimes. All best laid plans go. Uh, so now can you guys see my screen? Thumbs up, Andrew, because you're my spy. Yep, because no one else. All right, perfect. 
awesome. Um, and I'll just show you the other fateful failures exhibit because I think it's a visually cool. Um, but this is Diana Davis Spencer. So like I said, they're supporting us tonight. So we cannot thank them enough. But now I will show you the International Spy Museum, just to give you guys an idea of where we are. We are located in downtown Washington, DC. This is our brand new building that we opened in 2019. Um, if you have not visited, I highly suggest you do. It is completely different from the old museum. Um, but just so you guys know, we have the largest collection of espionage related artifacts on public display. We've been open since 2002, which is crazy to think about in our former space. And we have served teachers and students for over 19 years and are so excited to continue that. And we pride ourselves on that work and our mission. Um, so, and that's not really, I just wanted to get that out of the way so you all knew who we were and what we did. Um, but we also thought it was important before we delve in to 9-11, that we sort of talk about what is intelligence, why we have intelligence. And I think for students, it's such an important thing for them to know about today. Um, I always joke that, not joke, but I always say, every day, if a student reads a newspaper or scrolls on Twitter, or I guess TikTok, I don't really know. I don't understand TikTok. I, I now feel really old uh, when I say that. But every day, you can find a piece in a newspaper or on Twitter from a reputable source um, that deals with intelligence. It's always there, whether you know it or not. Um, and I think it's important from this standpoint to really know about what is the intelligence cycle, because I think a lot of times students and adults think that the spies that you see on screen make the decisions, make those actions. It's not the case. So I thought I'd quickly just go over that. Um, and if I'm going too fast or too slow, please stop me. Okay. So you start with the basic question. What do we need to know? All right, what are you trying to find out? Simple question, right? So then you send it off to figure out how are we gonna get that information? Are we gonna send a human spy in? Are we gonna try and collect that information through a satellite or through an encrypted system? Are we going to hack in? Like I said, if we don't need to send a human in, we're not going to, but I know that's what all of us think of when we are, think of spies and James Bond. So once that information is gathered, we then have to make sense of it. And the first task is, is it in English? Or not even, is it in English? Is it in a language we understand? All right. Or is it in code? Do we have to decode that message? All right. Or that information. And then it goes to the job of an analyst. And I have to say, I think... My nine years at the museum, I've learned to love the job of an analyst. Uh, and I'm sure if there are any CIA analysts watching, they're probably laughing at me right now. Um, but it is a job that I think is so critically important. That is also the most represented in the intelligence community and literally puts pieces of a puzzle together. We have a gallery in our exhibit called Making Sense of Secrets, and it's puzzles, mysteries, and secrets. And you're putting the pieces together. And in one of those interactives is all about the hunt for bin Laden. Um, and we use a method that analysts use today. And then once that information is collected, put together, made sense, it then goes to the policymakers. This is the key step that most people forget about. All right. It's not the analysts, it's not the spies making the decisions. It goes to the policymakers who then go and say, okay, we need more information or they set up a tack, something else, a diplomatic route, depends, all right? But that is the intelligence cycle, all right? That is the framework, basic framework, all right? And it'll start all over again, all right? It's a never ending cycle, all right? So what we thought we'd start with is sort of what happened prior to 9-11? I think we always think about 9-11 and intelligence started after that, right? Or we started, we went into Afghanistan after that, um, that prior to 9-11, Al-Qaeda wasn't really on our radar. This Osama bin Laden, we weren't, you know, who was he, all of that. Um, so afterwards, we then sort of start thinking, okay, what happened before that? And I think it's important to know what happened. And so just 
really briefly, not a lot of, <laughs> we can spend literally a, a whole semester talking about everything before 9-11. Uh, and Andrew knows here to chime in if I get anything wrong. I, I, actually, I actually have spent a whole semester on what came before 9-11 on a course I taught in, uh, in Staten Island once, but um, that's an aside. I don't know if I want to be in that class, but I'm sure I actually find it very interesting. Um, but so the picture you're looking at here is the bombing from the World Trade Center in 1993. And I think this was, I started with this image because I felt like this is where you're starting to see Al Qaeda wanting to sort of poke the bear and the bear being the United States, all right? It wasn't until 1996 that Al Qaeda was linked to the bombing from 1993, um, but and there's actually a really interesting podcast about that and I forget the podcast name, um, but I, so I shouldn't put anything. Do you know the podcast, Andrew? I think it's called Spycast. Fine, it's called Spycast. Andrew's being Andrew, and he's plugging his own <laughs> podcast, Spycast. That's what I thought you were talking about. Oh, I wasn't. This is a different podcast. I'm going to get to Spycast oh, later. Okay. It's okay. a good, it's an innocent mistake. Mm -hmm. um, but there's another podcast about um, Rami, uh, Razmi Youssef and the bombing. Um, but, and it sort of what, gave a hint at what Al Qaeda could be. All right, and also the uh, mastermind behind the um, bombing or mastermind behind the 9-11 attacks also was the mastermind behind the bombing in 93. And I think there's a, should be a picture coming up right there. All right, I have too many things going on my screen. I have too many pop-ups, all right. And then soon after the bombings of 1993, there was a report that was published not to the public, keep in mind, this was declassified many years later, called the Wandering Mujahideen. And I think either Liz or my colleague Jess is going to put a link in chat. Thanks, guys. Um, that's not the link I was looking for, but you got the podcast in there. <laughs> um, but the Wandering Mujahideen is an article that sort of lays out what is going on in Afghanistan um, after the Soviets have left. I'll leave it at that and sort of what happens going forward and how all of these individuals are wanting a jihad and are spreading out throughout Europe and Africa and Asia. And it's sort of a warning, all right? And it's, I am a firm believer that students should read primary documents and should understand primary documents. I think it's a great way to analyze history and as Andrew and I were talking, I, we both thought this would be a perfect article for high school students to read because A, it's short. It's, I think, four or five pages long, and some intelligence reports are really long and really boring. Uh, but also, I love the way intelligence reports are written. They are straight to the point. There is no fluff. There are no descriptors. It is direct to the point. And so I think all students, I really liked this article, and I also think the parallels to today with Afghanistan. I read it again the other day to refresh my memory and it, it was interesting. And I'll leave it at that for you all to make the parallels. Um, but I definitely recommend this uh, article and it'll be also in my follow-up email to you all. So you will have that resource for you guys. Um, but you also need to keep in mind the intelligence community in the nineties, they were focused on a lot of other things. All right, Hezbollah was a huge terrorist organization that was causing a lot of Americans to focus on that, all right? There are a lot of other terrorist threats going on and domestic terrorism, all right? Think about Oklahoma City that we were worried about. So Al-Qaeda was just in the background, okay? So then you have the U.S. Embassy attacks in 1998, both in Tanzania and Kenya. And I think this was where it was, and Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong. Bin Laden was like, hey, I'm coming. I, you know, I can do this on African soil at US embassies. You know, watch out. Am I right, Andrew? Yeah, and around this period in 1996 and in 1998, uh, Osama Bin Laden issue, issues fatwas against the United States. 
So I guess that's another, uh, you know, I'm putting myself on your radar. I'm your enemy. Yeah. And I think it's, I remember these attacks. I was a little kid, um, but I think it was the first time we sort of felt threatened by Al Qaeda, um, more so than the bombing in 93, because it wasn't quite linked there yet. Um, and I got this map from a former CIA analyst who was on the counterterrorism center, excuse me, unit. And it showed where all the attacks that Al Qaeda had been linked to up until 1996. And I think it's so interesting, only one in the United States, and that was the bombing in World Trade Center. Um, so it shows you how they were really focused, not in the United States, okay? And then there's also a lot of noise. And I think we talk about noises and signals and you know, making sense of all of this. And that's when we come to this PDB, the presidential, oh, before I get to that, it would help if I knew my slides. Um, I always love to talk to students about prior to 9-11 because it's such a foreign concept to them that cell phones didn't exist and that wireless didn't exist. <laughs> um, yes, Andrew, do you have a question? Yeah, just a just a just a really brief one. Um, can yeah. you go back to the Can you go back to the previous slide just briefly? Yes, I can. So, so um, Lucy and I spoke before this, and she said, "If I've got something to say, just jump in." So yes, not, I said that. So, so I'm not being rude. Um, I'm so proud of you, Andrew. <laughs> so, so, so one of the great things that I think about intelligence is that you can use it to teach almost any subject. So think about this slide here that Lucy just spoke about. You're teaching history, international relations, geography. Um, so we've got that part of it, which is the more obvious one. And just go to the previous slide really briefly, please. So this one here, if you think about it, these are like a lot of the big questions that humanity has faced since way back when. What do we need to know? Think about our ancestors. Think about them in the caves. What do we need to know? Um, it's, a, it's a big question and it's one that's relatively philosophical. But then how will we get it? So it's practical. You know, we need to take steps to get what we need. And then when we come to the next one, is it in code or foreign language? Think about human beings. We're constantly interpreting things not just other languages, but even our own language. What did my friend mean when they said that? What did my partner mean when they said that? Um, and for the code part, there's mathematics. So for intelligence, we've got STEM uh, up the wazoo. Um, code is all about mathematics. Uh, when Lucy was talking about spy satellites, that's all about technology. And then we get to four, what does it all mean? What could be more human than looking for patterns, than looking for uh, meaning in things? And then it goes to the decision makers. Okay, so we know all of this stuff and we've analyzed it, but somebody has to make a decision. And this goes back to Lucy's point, the decision makers, the most important commodity in Washington DC is time. So, you know, yeah. you, you imagine, I mean, I've always thought it must be a nightmare to be the president. Imagine all of the agita, all of the domestic <laughs> problems, all of the international problems. So uh, Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, um, Afghanistan, that's one issue amongst many, and it's competing against everything else. Sorry, that's, that's me done. No, I think that's so perfect, Andrew, and I usually talk about that. Um, so I skip my mind, but I agree. I, I think that's what makes this topic interesting is you can connect it to so many things too, especially in the classroom. Um, and speaking of the classroom, I thought we would do, I'm skipping ahead, you all know the types of intelligence or types of ways information is collected, whether it's satellites or on the ground reporting or videos. And so it was just sort of talking about students and how they don't think of that time before cell phones existed and internet. Um, but we're going to focus this first part uh, and sort of a practical application on 9-11 and the presidential daily brief. Um, every day, the president of the United States gets a daily briefing. And in it, it sort of highlights 
what's going on in the world from the intelligence standpoint. And it's short to the point. Um, Andrew, what is David Priest's books called? Uh, it's a, is it the Presidential Daily Brief? I think, is it the President's Book of Secrets? President's Book of Secrets by David Priest. It does a fantastic job of sort of talking about um, the Daily Brief, also how it's written and how it's delivered, I think makes for a fantastic student report or homework assignment. My former self as a student was like, why are you giving teachers ideas uh, for homework? But to have them write succinct, to the point, direct message, and only hit what it, you need to hit, hit, because the President of the United States does not have time for fluff. All right. And so on. we're going to travel back in time. So travel back in time. Um, and we're going to travel back to August 6, 20, 2001. I'm not going to lie, guys. I am having a hard time saying 2001 these days. I keep saying 2021. So I apologize. But August 6, 2001. Um, and we are actually going to Texas. We are going to Crawford, Texas, all right, to the Western White House. And the Western White House is where President Bush is at this time. And on August 6, 2001, he gets his daily brief, just like every other day. But this daily brief is interesting because if we fast forward to 2004, it's going to be declassified, all right? And what I'm going to have you guys do is if I can have my two little spy minions, if you guys can, one of you put in chat the link for the PDB from August 6, 2001. And pretend this is President Bush's desk. It's a very clean desk today. Um, we are going to read this report, all right? And the PDB is now linked, but I've also put it on the screen here for you guys to read. And just so you guys know, these are the couple questions I want you guys to think of, all right? So target for the attack. Can you find a specific target? Can you find a specific time for an attack? And also, what is the method that they are going to use? All right, so target, time, and method, okay? Also keep in mind, anything that is blacked out is redacted, it is still classified, it is still secret. You can hold it up to a light, you won't be able to see it, all right? Um, also, this is just a snippet of the PDB. It is not the entire PDB, Presidential Daily Brief. It's just a small portion, all right? So I'm going to let you guys read it for a second. and think about time, method, and place. All right, go ahead and type in chat if you want, if you notice, if you can identify what the method is, the time, or the place. Or let me ask you this question too. Have any of you guys read this document before? I hadn't heard about this until I started working at the museum. And I think when I read it, I was sort of, my mouth dropped open. And it took me a second. And I think I always set this up with students when I teach this in the class of saying, hindsight's 2020. It's easy to look back now and say, you know, why didn't we do anything? All right. But if you look closely, if I can get my highlighting points. All right. There are a couple of things that stick out to me. All right. Al-Qaeda members are already in the United States. All right. 
they have been looking around for locations. They want to hijack US aircrafts, right? And the blind shake that's referred to there is from 1993, that bombing. They also have are looking at federal buildings in New York, all right, as well as other buildings. And then finally, there's something about CIA and FBI. And I, I was talking to a former CIA analyst, and she said that was a term or that sentence right there was something that you rarely saw in a PDB, that the CIA and FBI in that same sentence, because they did not work together often. And they also did not share information to each other often prior to 9-11. Um, and so I take taking those pieces of information, there were there are no specifics. All right. There was a lot of noise, but there are no specific. It talks about intention, but we don't know the date. We don't know the time. We don't know exactly where. There are lots of federal buildings in New York. There are lots of planes. All right. So what do we do? And this is a question I pose to students. If you were President Bush, what course of action would you take? All right. And just to let you guys know, what I'm walking you through right now is an actual activity. It's in a lesson plan that you guys can download for free on our website. It's also going to be in that email I send you after with all those informations. And it has worksheets and everything. But we break it down to four different types four different options and you can divide the students into four different options and it's the first one is do nothing and just wait for more intelligence to come in all right the second is designate a no-fly zone and if anyone goes through that no-fly zone you shoot it down the third one is secure all u.s borders and don't allow any muslims in and put all u.s muslims in camps like we did to the japanese back during world war ii and finally, you ground all commercial airlines, all right, until more intelligence comes in. And what I have the students do is think through all of these different scenarios and describe how they would implement this action as president. They need to defend this course of action, all right, how to protect US citizens. What are the downsides? Are they economic, political, with the stock market crash? You'd have to come out and give a reason why you're doing this. And then are there any other times in history when this course of action was used? And they have to do research on it, all right? Red Scare and the Palmer Raids, World War II relocation and detention. So it's sort of letting the students think about all these different options and maybe come up with a different, an alternative option. It doesn't have to be these four, but it goes to show that President Bush, the, besides getting more intelligence, these options are okay, but they're not, they wouldn't prevent an attack. 9-11 would have still happened. It might have looked differently, but bin Laden was pretty key on attacking the United States. Andrew, am I missing anything? Um, I think you've, I think you've done a, I mean, I think, I think we spoke, when we spoke before, um, those four options can obviously be modified and you know, there are more than four options. There's always a, uh, you know, whole variety of different, uh, you know, things that you could potentially do. But I think I think the the purpose of the exercise is, is just that some course of action has to take place, even if that's no action. So which one are you going to choose as a student? Yeah. And so I think from that point, like I said, this, all of that is in, a lesson plan that you guys can download and use in your classroom. 9-11 um, itself was a day that will live in infamy. It's a day seared into our brains. We all knew where we were. And I, when I was thinking about doing this workshop, it didn't make sense to really focus on the events itself because the events itself unfolded. And the minute that second plane hit the World Trade Center, everyone at CIA knew it was Al-Qaeda. Um, and I also forgot to mention at the beginning, I use CIA because I have spoken to most people at CIA on this topic, all right? Not everyone. I mean, the people I've speak, spoken to are from CIA um, for the most part, but that doesn't mean every intelligence agency wasn't working 
all right, on Al Qaeda. They all had bits and pieces to it. Um, so when I say CIA, I think I should probably use it more generally as the intelligence community in general. But keeping in mind, CIA is the forefront of foreign intelligence in the United States. All right. And so I'm going to have Andrew quickly sort of go over how we use artifacts in the museum that sort of connect to 9-11 um, and can be used to teach in the classroom. So, and this is a podcast um, that was done for the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Um, and I, it talks about counterterrorism center, the CTC um, and an analyst. And so that link is also gonna be in uh, that email I send. But Andrew, let me go to the next slide. Like I said, this is our Fateful Failures exhibit. So go ahead, Andrew, sorry. Not, not at all. Um, yes, yeah, so well, Lucy just mentioned the podcast for the 10th anniversary. And just to put it on your radar, for the 20th anniversary, we're going to release uh, some podcasts, one of which features an interview with the person that gave President Bush the presidential daily brief that Lucy mentioned earlier on the morning of 9-11, Michael Morell former deputy director and acting director of the CIA. There's also going to be uh, an interview with Cheney's presidential daily briefer uh, and with Cheney's chief of staff's presidential daily briefer. So they're coming up if you're looking for more info. Um, they're going to okay. meet Mike Morrell later tonight, virtually, mm -hmm. or not in person, but they're going to see him later tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, I think, I think one of the great things about working at a museum is just the artifacts, the exhibitions, obviously. Um, you know, my training is as a historian and it's using documents, but artifacts, something tangible that you can touch, that you can look at, is a really powerful way to drive a lesson home. Um, I've introduced, and when I've taught um, in the past, I've introduced artifacts into the classroom and the students always appreciated them. Um, so if you just move on to the next uh, slide, please, Lucy. And just just briefly on the previous one, um, I'm, I'm sorry, can you jump back to the previous slide? Um, so you see here 9-11 uh, and Lucy mentioned at the beginning the war in Afghanistan. And speaking about 9-11 without talking about the post 9-11 wars, to me is a little bit like talking about Pearl Harbor without talking about World War II, but you know we've only got a certain amount of time tonight, so we're going to focus on 9-11, uh, but without 9-11, we don't have the war in Afghanistan, or certainly not in the manner that it played out. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is a whistle that was given to CIA staff after 9-11, just in case the headquarters were attacked again. So a brief personal story. I used to work at the 9-11 Museum uh, and I was in these offices in One World Financial Center, not Trade Center, but it's a building that's adjacent to the, to the, uh, the to Ground Zero. And we all had a, an emergency yellow go bag with a whole bunch of emergency kit in it. And we had to get drilled in it just in case something like this happened again. So for anybody that's old enough, I'm sure there's some, at least some people that are listening, flying on an airplane, airplane was very different before 9-11. Um, building security was quite different before 9-11. And then of course, everything changed. And this is a nice little example of one of the ways in which it changed. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have a um, medallion, a challenge coin uh, for people that were in the counter-terrorist center after 9-11. So think about, say, the CIA, which we've discussed quite a lot. What was the CIA focused on for most of its history? 1947 up until 1991, it was focused on the Soviet Union. What kind of adversary was that? Well, it was a nation state with nuclear weapons, tanks, airplanes, you know, armored divisions, all of the above. What's Al-Qaeda? Well, it's, it's like whack-a-mole. It's amorphous. It doesn't have a state. It doesn't have an army as we know it. 
it doesn't have nuclear weapons. So counterterrorism became the mission. And this is an interesting uh, example of the way that counterterrorism became, you know, one of the main things that uh, was, or the main thing that became important after 9-11. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, this one speaks for itself, Osama bin Laden. In 2001, he was on the top 10 most wanted list by the FBI. The first time I came to the States actually it was in 2000 and I came to Washington DC and I took a tour of FBI headquarters. And at the time I was a total current affairs nerd. And I remember asking a question about Osama bin Laden uh, and then funnily enough, uh, the following year, well, we all know what happened. So a poster um, takes us back. This is, that poster is after 9-11, but we can see ones that were before. I muted you by accident. I meant to mute me or unmute myself. I was about to say, I accidentally put that in the wrong order. That's no my problem. mistake. And then I muted you. So, so this one, for me, this is really powerful. So this is a, a fragment from a plane that flew into the World Trade Center. Uh, and when I worked at the 9-11 Museum, there were lots of different examples from the planes and from the towers. But again, it's just a piece of metal, right? At one level, a piece of metal is a piece of metal, but it's the story behind the metal. That's the power of the artifact. It's just a piece of metal, but what lies behind it? Well, we can use that to talk about the four planes that were hijacked. We can talk about the people that hijacked the planes and why they hijacked them. We can talk about where this ideology came from. We can talk about US foreign policy. So, so the, the artifact in some ways is a, it's an entry point. It's like a, a portal to talk about bigger stuff. Uh, and move on to the next slide, please. So this image on your left, I, I really like this image, the shadows of the Twin Towers. And in some ways, what we see playing out on the news, if anyone tuned into the news tonight, read the newspaper, what we see playing out is a result of this image on the left, of those two towers that were once there. At one point, the two tallest buildings in the world. And over here on the right, what you see, of course, is the now 9-11 Memorial and Museum. Uh, and if you just go, can can you put, yeah, yeah, just there, right? So where the arrow is just now, that's where my desk was. And almost every single day, I would look down at the largest terrorist attack in American history, the largest crime scene in American history. And one of the things that these, um, the, the, both the North and the South Tower, they're kind of like a, a, a memorial to, to the people that died and also to the tower that once stood there. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so I just want to play this for you. So the World Trade Center steel, this is quite interesting. Uh, for you. I know you're from all over the country, but in every single one of your states, there's a piece of World Trade Center steel. It's in every state in the country, and it's over the world. It's in London, it's in Afghanistan, it's in Iraq, it's in a whole variety of other places. And remember, I was talking about the power of artifacts and it just being steel. I want you to think about that when you watch this. This is a sword that's forged from World Trade Center steel. These are all veterans and they're all either touching the sword or they're touching someone who's touching the sword and listen to what they say. Is it just me? Now, can you hear it? Okay. Just pause it there. Um, I'll, I'll fill in the blanks. What they're doing is 
They're making a vow not to take their own lives. So a sword made of World Trade Center steel was used to try to combat the, uh, some of the mental health issues and some of the issues surrounding suicide and the veteran community. So again, this is just a piece of steel, right? But if you look at this, if anybody goes to church, if anybody goes to any house of worship, this almost takes on a religious kind of significance. I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but it's almost like an altar and it's like a, a holy artifact. And if you, I've, I've interviewed a lot of veterans and they've said that 9-11, uh, the ground zero site was almost like sacred ground. And this piece of steel was almost like a religious artifact. So again, it's an artifact, which museums are in the business of housing, but it's the story that lies behind it. So you can use this to talk about all kinds of issues. And this is an example we have in the museum. So this is from a, um, a, a sergeant that was killed in Afghanistan. And he was, um, I believe he was seconded there from the National Security Agency. This is made from World Trade Center steel. Again, just a piece of steel, but it's the power of the steel, it's the story behind the steel that's important. And I think that, uh, you know, in our museum, you know, if you ever get a chance to come to DC, please come to see it. We've got some really powerful artifacts and you can open up so much just by engaging with them. Uh, next artifact, please, or next slide, please, sorry. Uh, and here we see an example here of matchbooks that were distributed across Pakistan. So where is Osama bin Laden? So when I was at the 9-11 Museum, they used to have a sign that a lady from Brooklyn put in her front garden saying, where was Osama bin Laden? And every day she went out and flipped uh, a card over and it went to one year one year and one day and so on upwards until nine years. And I can't remember off the top of my head the number of days, but um, yeah, these matchbooks as well, like this guy Osama Bin Laden, okay, who are you talking about it? Here's, here's something tangible you can look at. Why would people do this? Why would they put it on a matchbook? And next slide, please. And this is a, these artifacts are so amazing. This is a rug from Afghanistan. So in Afghan culture, so Persian rugs, Afghan rugs, they're renowned the world over for their craftsmanship um, and for the, the artistry that goes into them. And Afghanistan since 1979 in one form or another has been in a state of conflict and a state of flux. And they've used these rugs to interpret their lives and what's going on around them. And you see here examples of Kalashnikovs, of Soviet helicopters, of bombs, and so forth. So again, just using the artifact to try to tell a bigger story. So for this, just off the top of my head, using this artifact, you could illustrate to students that during the 1980s, Afghanistan became the most heavily armed country in the world per head of population. Um, another one here, the Stinger missile launch tube. So the CIA uh, engaged in a covert action to arm the Mujahideen during the 1980s to you know, fight against the Soviets. And this is one of, one of the launch tubes that was quite critical, uh, but we don't have too much time to go into here, but again, you can open up so much just by engaging with one artifact. Yeah, and a lot of these artifacts are available just to see on our website. Um, so I, I think to see them also in person, I will never forget the day we got that piece of steel. Um, we also have a burned manual from um, one of the hijackers. And I think when the data came in, it just all of our hearts just stopped for a second. Um, and how powerful just an object can be. But as we're closing down, I just sort of wanted to leave with a couple of things that I think is, are important for students to understand today. Um, 
after 9-11, it completely transformed the intelligence community. Um, and I think for us adults, it's easy to figure that out. But for students who never were alive pre-9-11, they don't understand that there wasn't a director of national intelligence, all right? There was no ODNI, all right? There was no Homeland Security or Customs Enforcement, Immigration, not a, Customs Enforcement, ICE, all right? The Patriot Act didn't exist before, all right? You think of surveillance and how that changed, um, you know, and I think civil liberties came into question. Um, and it also changed the intelligence community. It changed the way they talk to each other. Remember how I said in that PDB, FBI and CIA didn't really talk prior to 9-11? By having the ODNI, the Director of National Intelligence and the Office of Director of National Intelligence, they changed and made it one central place because everyone was realizing they all had different information, but they weren't communicating with each other. And I think that's really important. Um, and just recently, Space Force was added. So I actually had to make my own diagram to include Space Force in this. Um, but it sort of shows you all the different intelligence agencies that fall under the ODNI, including the Department of Energy, which I always think is interesting because they keep the nuclear codes, which I didn't realize. All right. Um, and so that is how I leave it. Um, unfortunately, I ended later. Andrew had to leave. Um, but I think today in Afghanistan, I don't, there's not, I don't know what to say and I don't know how I would explain it to your students, but I do think that Wandering Mujahideen personally is a really good article to read and sort of think as a parallel. I hope history doesn't repeat itself. Um, but I, you know, I do think it's something that students should be aware of and should talk about in your classes. Um, and just a couple quick resources for you guys. Um, our YouTube channel, YouTube channel has some amazing lectures and some amazing videos of speakers talking about this topic. Um, and they're available free um, for you all to look at and enjoy. Um, and then we also have podcasts, as uh, Andrew pointed out, called Spycast. Um, he started a year ago and has transformed the spy cast um, from when it was before. Um, and I know you'll continue to do some great things. I'm really looking forward to hearing the Mike Morrell podcast next week. Um, and that 9-11 lesson plan, as I said, is, is available on our website free for the download and will be in that email I send shortly to you all. Um, and finally, I am happy to answer any questions you guys have. I'm happy to stay around. Um, and answer any questions. Um, but another great way to reach out to us is educators at spymuseum.org. We are always happy to chat and um, get more information from you guys, see if we can make something work. Um, and like I said, this program would not be possible without the support of Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. I honestly, I cannot thank them enough, um, especially with this Title I initiative. I, I, I've been at the museum nine years and I'm so proud to finally be able to say we offer free workshops and museum admission for Title I schools. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, good luck with the start of the school year. Um, let's hope it is a much more normal school year than the past year and a half. Um, but please know that we are here for you and we are happy to help in any way. So thank you everyone. Um,